Oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, my dad told me to ask you if you're jumping on the football team wagon after they beat the 49ers. Oh, we're jumping on the bandwagon? Yeah. Gosh, you know. I don't know, after, after the football team beat a bad team. Yeah, before the every, every, No offense, but everybody on the team is hurt. Uh, we've played with over like 70 players or something. <laughs> All of our practice squad guys have played. We have like 20 guys on IR. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, it's just not a good year. I sympathize. Got the three quarterbacks, um, countless receivers. Lost two starting D linemen on the same drive. So. But it's okay. One maybe the best D lineman in football. Yeah, I think Bose is one of the best D ends. Still got Richard Sherman though. He came back after like ten weeks being hurt. Okay. All right, just a couple things really quick. So I, I'll get yours graded. Uh, on the DBQ, you know, most people in here, oh, I got most of them graded. So you, everyone at home, if I don't have yours graded, there's a few. Please uh, give me time. I should have it done. I'll try to get it. To, uh, I want to get them done today, so I don't have to worry about them. And. Uh, I will give a chance if you got below B to try to redo a few things. Uh, but most people got A's and B's. I thought they were good. And good for a first one. There are a few mistakes, and the biggest mistake people have was outside information and explanation. Uh, just didn't quite put enough down. And for example, document one talked about the Republican platform. And people, uh, some people just wrote down, and the Republican platform was against slavery in the territories. Yeah, that's fine. You read the document, but that's not enough. You have to say something about, and that shows, for example, the free soil position. Add that addition. It's not enough just to write in the document. Then you add, you connect it to something you know. And then show how that uh, proves your thesis. And so that was the biggest thing. So I'm always going to ask for more outside information. And that's the OI. I wrote down OI partially to save my finger when I'm typing. Just have you know get it done as quickly as possible. You have to highlight it and then push like three buttons to finally type. It's not hard, but it, it, gets, it gets frustrating. <laughs> Especially when you sometimes click and for whatever reason the internet was slow, and all of a sudden it just sits there. It's like, ah! Okay, I'm done whining. No, I'm not. I'm going to whine more. And let me tell you what else. And well, some people made a horrible factual mistake. And if you didn't have a lot of outside information, but you know, got the documents, had some kind of organization, even if you didn't have a lot of outside information. You probably got a B. So like, okay, you got things together, and it's it's tough to put everything together that first time. And it's or even maybe a low A. You know, I kind of I, I kind of weighed my odd uh, choices on that. You know, I could tell, and at least I could guess. But a lot of people put down, especially third period for some reason, which is just weird. I, I know they should, but it just happened to be that way. But a few people this period did too. They put down that Lincoln and the Republicans were abolitionists who wanted to get rid of slavery in the United States. And that was completely untrue. You know, Lincoln was a free soil. He was not an abolitionist. Yeah, he didn't want slavery, but he was not an abolitionist. And I you know, try to make that very clear. And that is a huge mistake. Because if you write that down, not only does that kind of throw out everything else you say, it's like, God, do you really know any of this? You just read the document and it's winging it. And they're winging it. But that was what the, the Southern Democrats tried to portray the Republicans out as to bash them as radicals, and that's why they called them black Republicans. But also, another big reason is I had this posted when you came in and also shared it to everybody at home. Yes. This! I even said it! So that's a huge mistake. So if you didn't have good use of the documents, or I'm sorry, you know, outside information and this, that's where you start getting lower grades. But most people I thought did pretty good. In fact, a lot of people did fantastic on it. Good outside information, good documents. I try to get comments on there. I do use a little key, a grading key, and I posted that. That's why I asked you to look at. But that key, you know, for the letters. So if I just write down Q, it just means you didn't address the question. Just so I can just I can put down Q, and that's all it means. Because some people forgot, you know, they started writing down their blueprint and just forgot the question, which is a pretty common 
mistake. Um, you know, the content, the examples, OI, that's your outside information. That's stuff you bring. And we need a lot of that. That shows you understand. A few people still quoted the documents. You can't quote the documents. I don't want quotes. They don't want quotes. Quoting just implies that you're copying and moving on, even if you know exactly what you're writing about. You have to use your own words. Maybe one time in an essay, if there's a five words from that quote that just fit in so perfectly along with what else you say, you can do it, but no quotes. So I can't have that. But I thought pretty good. And uh, we will do another one here fairly soon. We'll do a couple of practice ones, kind of do part, part of it. Let me have one more thing. If you got below an 80%, so this means everybody at home too. Uh, I think, I don't think you can practice this in here. But I know it doesn't, but I probably won't. Or maybe a little bead, but I want to make sure that you have a chance to try to get the documents when you made a pretty big mistake. To at least get a few of those points back, you have to do three things. I'm talking to the people at home. Three things if you want to redo part of it. You have to give me a good out, brainstorm outline and thesis. I could tell a lot of people who didn't give me very good essay with, uh, without outside information didn't give me a brainstorm list. If you don't have a brainstorm list, that implies you haven't really thought, you haven't gone through the material you need, you need to have the essay, having the essay. But that kind of implies that you did like quick look at it three minutes before class and jotted something down sloppily. And your paper shows. So I'll give you a chance to get that better. But of course, I, you know, not gonna happen again next semester. And brainstorm outline a thesis, the opening paragraph with good context and your thesis, and then any one of your body paragraphs. Those three things. And you have a few days to do it in the break. Send it to me. I might not grade it for a few days, you know, because it's a break, but I will get that done. Has so everyone got that? Raise your mind on a thesis, opening paragraph, one of your body. All right, I do have to have Christmas Joy, AKA assignment. I know you're excited. As I've said before, if we didn't have to, I wouldn't do it. It's just life. We have to get stuff done. And we're way behind, but it's three parts, a little bit of reading, and here's I, the link to the chapter list. So 15, a little bit of 16. The Civil War map, I haven't posted that as an assignment yet, but I will post that so you can turn it online. I, I just didn't think about doing it. I just, just think about getting all that down. And then there'll be a chance for extra credit. Follow the directions on there. Sound good? You excited? Almost Festivus. Yes, I still have another test today. So. You do? Yeah. Good for you. Oh, finals week. So finals week's really up in the air because, I mean, this is just a weird year where everyone's behind. And they were going to do one day for A, one day for B, one day for digital. Have you guys heard about that? That's what they're doing. And it's it still hasn't been decided how uh, just for this year, just because of the nature of trying to do it, that means potential for seven full finals in a day for some students. They'd have to be shorter than three. Right? Yeah. But we're, um, we just go, um, teachers are being given a lot of leeway. And just because of, of that, I decided to do one of the off, one of the things, the way I'm looking at it is we're going to have for the final, will be basically just whatever unit test we're at. Just gonna be a unit test. And I'll take into account the days, but I've got just, we just and so then we are behind just because we're losing so much time from the shortened periods and everything takes longer. But then we just kind of push on. Sound good? That's why I'm doing it. And uh, but I'm giving the chance for extra credit, a few things like that. Let's get to the Civil War. So we talked about all the Civil War. Um, this is all I got to show you one of my favorite things. The James Buchanan's non, <laughs> the, you can't leave the Union, can't stop you. That's really taken a strong stance. And then he literally hit under the desk, fearful of assassination. Not exactly the kind of president you would want at that time. That's for many reasons, considered one of the worst presidents in history. In fact, it's kind of amazing we've had um, 
Tyler considered one of the worst. Polk wasn't. Fillmore's considered pretty bad, and Taylor just because of the kind of the mishandling of the whole situation. Pierce might be the worst ever, and then Buchanan, and then Civil War. Really shows me how a vacuum of leadership what can happen. I mean, that has long term effects. But I just like that picture. Isn't that see, the most eligible bachelor in America? And so we talked about the Crittenden Compromise, the new Confederacy, King Cotton Diplomacy, remember to not trade for cotton with Britain, terrible disaster. And I think we got right to Sumter, didn't we? We finished with Sumter being shelled and that started the Civil War. Is that where we quit on Wednesday? That sound right? Yeah, it was something. Yeah, we talked about the open fire. And... One man was killed and a horse kill was killed. In the fight, above the start to the bloodiest battle, the bloodiest war in American history. And I think I showed this the Star of Mars, the Confederate flag, and I believe I got right to hear that. So the Upper South joined the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia became the new capital. But I should add that North, many in the North were now unified. This was clear aggression by the South. And so this unified them for union. And these states in yellow remain border states. Let me make sure this is all showing up. Looks good, looks good, okay. Oops, just a second. Okay, so with that, the United States Army immediately called out for volunteers. And the thought was this would be a short war. Originally, it was a 90 day hitch. They figured in 90 days we'd be out, which is not enough time to really train. They would drill, some training, but the US Army was tiny, there were almost no officers. And I'm sure a little bit of a, oh, here's, Soldiers being drilled. And the big thing is marching and staying in straight lines because the tactics were not a heck of a lot different than the Revolutionary War or Napoleonic era. Line up in straight arm or straight lines and blaze away at each other's faces. But the weapons are much more deadly. And here's the volunteers. So the Civil War series, uh, this is a series that was done on uh, uh, it's considered one of the greatest documentaries ever made. Uh, I mean, Ken Burns, who is uh, kind of the most famous documentarian in America in history. But he did this in the late 1980s. And it's a very good documentary, at least well organized, but like a lot of things about the Civil War, it's very pro Confederacy. A lot of Civil War history has this really Southern tint to it. You're trying to say the nobility of the South, fighting for freedom and honor, which is. Uh, Southern propaganda after the war. But I show a couple, I normally would show a couple of them, I can't show one, but uh, called The Cause, the first one. But I'm showing you just a couple minutes of it because it shows just, uh, that's a good job um, showing the volunteers coming in, a little com um, their comments from people. I like it. So from the union. What a tiny. Little tiny units. You've seen it. Okay, that's a little one. Hercules Theater, that's a name. 
ठीक है The 10th Michigan Volunteer Infantry was made up of Flint boys. Their commander was the mayor, their regimental doctor, the man who'd been taking care of them since they were young. The 6th New York contained so many Bowery toughs, it was said a man had to have done time in prison just to get into the regiment. The elite 7th, on the other hand, set out for Washington with sandwiches from Delmonico's and a thousand velvet-covered camp stools on which to sit and eat them. On his way to war, Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer, just 22 and less than a month out of West Point, where he'd graduated at the bottom of his class, stopped in New York to have himself fitted out with a splendid new uniform, then went to a photographer. It'd be pretty common It'd be pretty common to get your picture taken. I mean, you have all these great pictures of guys with all these guns on them. You know, get a new one of these newfangled photos. And that's one of the great records of them, of the Civil War. Look at, I like the posters. So this is New York, New York, and these are Zouaves. Everybody in the military, all over the world, every military copies of the French. Uh, for lots of reasons, the French were famous, are famous for having great soldiers, and then Napoleon was the big reason. And you know, the French army was always very powerful. We're not going to talk about French generals in World War II. That's another story. But the army was good. But the French, these were copied North African soldiers. They're called Zouaves. And they were these big, flowing, all kinds of colors. But these just happened to be red. And up through 1862, there was a lot of northern Zouaves. This became very impractical as the war went on. But that's where that comes from. By the way, the hat called the Keepy hat. And that's where baseball caps come from. A French, it was a French private town. Here's the Irish Brigade. If you look at that map, or that uh, flag over there behind the uh, US, United States in 1861, that's another one of the Irish, uh, regiment in the Irish Brigade. Irish immigrants in New York City. So the South too joined. But the South, they didn't have near the manufacturing. They couldn't make and have uniforms. And so uh, here's what most Confederates wore, badly colorized, but it's just whatever clothes they had. And most of them were kind of dyed a brown because there's a cheap dye. So you hear the blue and the gray, only wealthy Confederates, officers mostly had gray uniforms. Most were kind of brownish, bland, tan. Early in the war though, there's so many, so many militias in the South that they wore whatever uniforms the militia had. So there were a lot of Confederates in blue. They wore those militia uniforms. At least the, those were in the militia when the war began. There's red, there's green, there's gray. There's all kinds of militia colors. So it's a, really a hodgepodge for the Confederates. So let me show you just a little bit of this, but let me get, let me make sure the sound works. New Orleans, 1861. I feel that I would like to shoot a Yankee. And yet I know that this would not be in harmony with the spirit of Christianity. William Nugent. So impatient did I become for starting that I felt like a thousand pins were pricking me in every part of my body and I started off a week in advance of my brothers. I found Mobile boiling over with enthusiasm. The young merchants had dropped their ledgers and were forming and drilling companies by night and day. Every day regiments marched by 
Charleston is crowded with soldiers. These new ones are running in fairly. They fear the war will be over before they get sight of the fun. Every man from every little country precinct wants a place in the picture. The Confederate government, its capital now in Richmond, called for 100,000 volunteers. So many Southerners volunteered that a third of them had to be sent home. They came from Catahoula and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Greenville, Mississippi, Moonsville, Alabama, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Tennessee joined the Confederacy. So did Arkansas and North Carolina. In Memphis, Nathan Bedford Forrest, a blacksmith's son who had made himself a millionaire selling land, cotton, and slaves, put up posters calling on anyone who wanted to kill Yankees to come and ride with him. Great the clinch rifles from Augusta, Georgia, started out in May 1861. Only the drummer boy would survive. The odds against a Southern victory were long. So look at it, say the population, get the population numbers. It's really startling. So this one, write this down. There were nearly 21 million people in the North, just 9 million in the Confederacy, and 4 million of them were slaves, whom their masters did not dare arm. 21 to 9, four slaves. See the, the value of all the manufactured goods produced in all the Confederate states added up to less than one-fourth of those produced in New York State alone. Yeah. All the manufacturing in the South was one-fourth, actually it's one-fourth of New York City alone. They have almost no manufacturing, no population. The odds are long if you look at it that way. So only five million total white people that you can arm. Slaves cannot fight to defend slavery, even though there's a myth that exists to this day amongst pro-Confederates. To this day, they're called neo-Confederates now. Let's say slaves fought for the Confederates. They're trying to say, see, we're not so racist. But none of this mattered to the men who joined the Tallapoosa Thrashers and Chickasaw Desperados and Cherokee Lincoln Killers. The Cherokee Lincoln Killers. By the way, uh, the Thrashers, the, the, at least it kind of sound like really bad uh, minor league baseball players. Or good, not minor league baseball players. There's a hockey team in Atlanta called yeah. Here's the thing about them. They mentioned that here the Cherokee. Remember all those tribes that were sent west in the Trail of Tears and Indian removal? Almost all of them joined the Confederacy. Now you might think, wait a second, what's it? They're joining the people who are now living on their land in the South? But they blame the US government. The enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. All right. So Let's go ahead then and get through the forest. I have to make one more change. I hope this works. That'd be good. So many buttons. Teens has so many quirks. So here are a couple ones from uh, camp, uh, recruiting posters from the South. And I really like this one. Well, first one, free men. Fight for freedom, the house light. But your soil has been invaded by your abolitionist foes. That lays out exactly the way they look at the North, how they present it. They're coming to free the slaves and start a slave rebellion. We are the target. And that one's before Sumter. So a couple things are going to happen with this. First off, Baltimore lie between Washington, D.C. and the rest of the North. Baltimore, a big town. In fact, to get to Washington, D.C., all these new recruits are going to have to get off the train, they take the B&O Railroad from Baltimore, they get off the train here, walk across town to the RF&P, they go to Washington. The terminals didn't connect at the beginning of the war. And so these are new recruits, and in early June, a regiment of new, or I'm sorry, in a bay, a regiment of new recruits in Massachusetts was attacked by a pro-Confederate mob in Baltimore. In fact, the mayor of Baltimore was pro-Confederate. And they opened fire. And so there was fighting in the streets of Baltimore. The United States can't survive if they can't get troops to Washington, D.C. 
if the U.S. lost Washington, D.C., had to evacuate, it would be such a humiliating defeat, they might have had to give up and the U.S. be done. This is a big deal. And Lincoln is sitting in Washington, D.C. now panicking. He can't allow pro-Confederates taking over Baltimore. And who knows, Maryland might grow. go. And so Lincoln has to deal with an internal insurrection. It's not just the rebellion of the Confederates. It's an insurrection in elements of the areas that are still technically states. Now, habeas corpus is guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. And it says that everybody has a right to trial. In fact, you have to be charged with a crime and then tried. You can't just be arrested. Remember we mentioned the Fifth Amendment that says you have due process of the law? That's due process. You cannot just be ar arrested. But Lincoln wants to arrest every suspected Confederate. He needs to open up Baltimore and other places too. So Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. The president cannot do this. Congress can give the authority to the president in times of insurrection, but Congress was out of session that summer. Remember, they didn't meet in the summer because it's so hot in D.C., so they kept, which is so amazing, they kept up the same old practices during the rebellion. So Lincoln is doing this all by executive order. Unprecedented. So Lincoln suspended this. It went to him and the Supreme Court, because this is federal. Chief Justice Roger Taney, the same one who thought he could solve the entire problem with Dred Scott, he took this, read the Constitution, and realized Lincoln violated the Constitution. You can't do that. What was Lincoln's response? Lincoln ignored him. In fact, Lincoln contemplated arresting the Chief Justice. That should give you an idea how incredible these times were. So Lincoln violated the Constitution, ignored the Supreme Court, and this goes against what gets a lot of the myth about Abraham Lincoln, of this noble politician who, there's always stories about how compassionate he was, a lot of this came after he was assassinated. Lincoln was a ruthless, hard-nosed politician. In fact, people did not realize it at the time, how ruthless he was. And he was going to save the Union. Of course, that might mean also by destroying it, but he was going to save it. And that's part of the reason why he's considered at least in the top two of the greatest presidents of all time. The other one's William Henry Harrison. And that one day he was president before he, he cholera killed him. He, the other one considered the greatest is probably Franklin Roosevelt. We'll get to him. That whole depression, World War II thing, kind of a big deal. But here's Lincoln as like the, eagle, the federal eagle, and that's various laws in the Constitution. You know, free press and everything he, as a burning as he stands. So there's a lot of anger over this. Lincoln violated Congress after the fact would retroactively give Lincoln this power, but Lincoln violated the Constitution. And people forget that when they talk about Lincoln. This was a cut and dry case. He ignored the Supreme Court. A lot of people claim that Jackson violated or ignored the Supreme Court over Indian removal. It was much more complex for that, at least for the time. This one, cut and dry, Lincoln ignored it. Might have been the right to move, but they almost immediately started arresting uh, the, the mayor of Baltimore, uh, many local politicians, the police chief were all arrested by the U.S. Army. In fact, they, this also happened in Chicago. A bunch of newspapers were shut down. And they were all taken to Fort McHenry. Remember that one? Fort McHenry, including the grandson of Francis Scott Key. Remember, Key was the man who wrote the, the Star Spangled Banner. They were arrested for pro-Confederate sympathies and held ironically for Key, in Fort McHenry. And so with that, here's what the Union looked like the summer of 1861. These states had joined the Confederacy. These states in kind of the aqua, bluish green, they were border states here and these two. I should give a brief explanation about West Virginia. That's, that was Virginia when the war began. 
The U.S. in 1863 literally just carved this area out and made a state. There were mostly Union people there, and so they just took it from Virginia. So they'd have another northern state in the bottom. So that's how come West Virginia is a state. They almost did the same thing for eastern Tennessee. A lot of Union people there. And northern Alabama. That didn't happen. West, that's the most famous one. And these states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, all have slavery. And there's a lot of pro-slavery, at least not pro-slavery, but uh, you know, there's a lot of dough faces still in the North. Remember dough faces? And a lot of sympathy for the North. Lincoln is holding together this pro-union coalition, and he's very, very nervous about this. I should add, look how poor Kentucky is. The Ohio River is necessary for the war to get food supplies. Kentucky goes to the Confederacy. That could be huge, almost as big as Maryland going. But slavery will have to be answered right away. At first, Lincoln didn't want to touch it. In fact, he ordered slaves to be returned. If slaves run away to, to the new Union Army lines, return them. Return them to their owners. He didn't want to anger these border states. Didn't want to, he wanted to keep Northern Democrats with the Union side. Now, it was a, not the most brave decision to save the Union and in the long run get rid of slavery is what would happen. Maybe it was the right move. But people like Frederick Douglass were furious with Lincoln for this. Absolutely furious. But back here, when Virginia left near Jamestown, remember, and Yorktown, there was a fort that the Union Army kept, even though Virginia went to the Confederacy. It's right where my mouse is, right there. Important fort. And General Benjamin Butler, right here, he's a, Demo a free soil Democrat from Massachusetts. Um, because he was a prominent politician, they made him a general. He was given command here. They basically had to create all these generals, and a lot of prominent politicians were made generals. Most of them were horrible generals, a few good ones. He was not a great commander, but pretty wily politician. He wanted to be president, very clever man with crossed eyes, literally. Butler was having all of these slaves, and these are Virginia slaves during the war, who were running away to his fort, asking to be protected. And the order was, return them. What do you do with all these fugitives? Butler wanted to take them in. A similar, similar thing happened in St. Louis. And Lincoln ordered the general there, who was, remember, John C. Fremont? It was Fremont. You have to return them. Butler came up with a novel idea. Slaves are helping the Confederate war effort. They're doing um, agricultural work, producing food, and they're also building the trenches and, and fortifications for the Confederates. If slaves are helping the war effort, would it be good to, to take them into the North? And he said, I'm going to allow fugitive slaves because they are contrabands of war. I'll take away their laborers so they can't fight the war. Of course, then again, he'll turn them into laborers for the Union. So they'll get freedom, but it's not, I mean, they'll get more freedom, but then they'll be going to kind of a limbo. They wouldn't be officially free till, ironically, on this day in 1865. This is the day, the anniversary of the, um, uh, the ratification of the 13th Amendment that ended slavery. It's ironically on this day. So here's three contraband, eight, that's what they would call these fugitives, contrabands. A weird name, but they ran away and they're talking about, about getting their freedom. Now Lincoln had a tough call on this. This might anger border states, but Butler's right. So this is what we gotta get, Lincoln agreed. And gave the order to allow for runaways. And once that happened, the trickle of runaways turned into a flood wherever the Union Army was. Of all these men, women, and children desperately trying to get out or away from the hells of, of slavery, going to the Union line. So even though the United States still had not said they were against slavery as part of the war effort, it started. It is started. And these are going to be contrabands. And this would set the precedent. 
By the end of 1862, most of those men who would be started as contrabands would volunteer and fight for the United States Army and be decisive for the victory of the U.S. in the Civil War. So here's a couple. These are, you know, they're wearing Union uniforms, but these are, they ran away from their plantation. And a lot of them would be laborers. I mean, it was not great. So better be enslaved. And here's a cartoon showing uh, former slaves running away to Fort Monroe and trying to get them back. Yes, it's racist, but it's also anti-South. It's complex. It's just complex, the cartoons at the time. But big deal. Butler's an interesting guy. He'd become a major villain to the South. And so we jump right to here. We're leading up to the very first battle of the Civil War. The first major battle, even though this would be a relatively small one. The Battle of Bull Run, Jan, uh, July 21st, 1861. So let's go to the Battle of Manassas. I'll explain this in just one second. But the United States is thinking on to Richmond. Richmond is so close to Washington, D.C. So close. Let me just show you this real quick, and then I'll go back. Oops, wrong way. I got out of order. Here's Washington, D.C. right here. Richmond's right here. By the way, this map is from 1861, and I love what it's titled. The Seat of the War. Seat of War. What a name, huh? Almost all the battles are going to be fought here because they have to be in walking distance. There's more rivers in the west, like in Mississippi. So the battle will be more spread out here. All right. And so the thought was, let's just march down and take Richmond. And the plan was follow the railroads, go here and then down. Take Richmond. And the thought was, take Richmond, war's over. But everyone thought it was going to be a 90-day war. And those enlistments are running out. And so Lincoln is pushing the United States Army to go. Even though General Scott, the commander, is saying, we're not ready to fight. Lincoln is pushing and pushing, so they agree. And here are two political cartoons showing why many people in the North thought they would win. Here are a couple Confederate soldiers, and they draw them purposely like hillbillies. Like, These guys couldn't stop you. Look at them. And here's a Zouave chasing a Confederate soldier to Richmond. And you know it's implying that they're drunk. That's a bottle. But they'll be easy to beat. Solid, upstanding, hardworking Northerners will defeat the lazy Southerners. Yeah, that's... Moonshine making something. Moonshine, yeah. Ooh, that's a moonshine making yep. a little alliteration. And with that, they just assumed they would win. But don't forget the Southerners have that military tradition because they had, had such a strong militia system to put down slave rebellions. And one more thing. Even if your armies are green, which means inexperienced, Fighting on the defensive is much easier than on the offensive. If you're defending something, the enemy's got to come out of their positions and attack you. They're exposed. It is easier to defend. You don't need as many men. But Lincoln pushed. Oh, so let's get to why they call the battle. All these battles are going to have two battle names, at least in the beginning. And we're not going to go through everyone. There'll be a few battles and stories I'll tell. Some are really important for the history. The North named their battles after the nearest waterway, river. There's a little creek near the battle called Bull Run. So Bull Run. So this is the first battle of Bull Run. The Confederates at first named their battle after the nearest waterway. I'm sorry, that's after the nearest city or village. There's a little railway, jun railway junction called Manassas. So the Battle of Manassas. So that's the Confederate name. It's Bull Run to me. Everyone's on my call of Manassas. But There'll be a lot of battles like this, like uh, the bloodiest day in American history, and uh, maybe the most important battle of the war, the Battle of Antietam. It's on Antietam Creek, but the Confederates called it Sharpsburg. But by 1863, they just started going with a common name. So Gettysburg is Gettysburg. That's the biggest battle. Everyone called it Gettysburg. So at that, so. Here is the Union Army, eventually be over 37,000 men here. And there are a couple co Confederates just trying to hold railway junctions. And the Confederates are outnumbered, but if they're able to pull the men together, it's going to be pretty close. 
And here's Manassas right here. So the Union plan was here, advance here along the railroad, and then turn and take Richmond. They wanted the railroads for supply. So the Confederates know they're going to try to stay on the railroad. Everything had changed. Now armies have to stick to railroads. It changed everything. World War I, everything was about railroads. Part, part of the reason they were stuck in trench warfare in World War I is they, would out, they had to stay next to the railheads. But the Union commander was an experienced officer, but very limited battle experience. Erwin McDowell. He had been a junior officer in the Mexican War. McDowell was right here. You know, so the keepy hats that would come baseball hats. They're kind of high. So they put the, the back right here and kind of stick it down over their nose. He didn't want to fight. Yeah, he wanted to wait, but he was ordered to go. The Confederates had two commanders. Now, remember PGT Beauregard? He was the man who ordered the shelling at Sumter. Beauregard was the command at Manassas. And so he did most of the decisions. But when he was reinforced by General Joseph E. Johnston, Johnston was actually the highest ranked officer. Beauregard was pretty ornery, and Jefferson Davis hated him. Johnson's probably the most popular Confederate general of the war. The men adored him. You notice I did not say Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, who most people know, was considered too old and just in charge of Virginia's militia. Lee will come back. And so, Beauregard, Pierre Gustave Toulance Beauregard. It never just said PGT. And don't forget, all the officers knew each other if they were regular army because the army was so small. And on that note, okay, so on Monday, when we get back after the break, what is it? It's going to be like fifth, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah. So, the day, I'll, I'll go through as much of the war I can. There'll be a few stories. I'll put up that map assignment. Any questions on that? Yeah. And as soon as I can, I'll get your DBQ out. Yeah. And did you read it? Did you read what I wrote about the outline? No. Please read it, but um, um, on the back, I was just a rubric for how to call it. Don't worry. I mean, but just take a check or take a look. I think I gave you the link of an outline for what I'm, what I'm thinking. It's not a big deal. I, and I know you organized it, so don't worry. And I put a lot of comments on it. Oh, and if I wrote a number of times, if I put something like, you need more faces here. Yeah, I don't know how I got the E and the P. I put the facts. More facts, more faces. Nice face. <laughs> Not a lot of that.